Thanks, everybody. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. Uh, one of, if not the most radical movies ever be nominated for an Oscar has to be our next guest film, Hell County, this morning, this evening. It gives me hope for the future of the Academy that a movie this beautiful and off the beaten path can make it into the most mainstream awards competition there is. Ramel Ross's film explores the lives of the people living in Hale County in a mosaic of vignettes that reveal more about the poetry of life in a single image than most 90 minute movies can. In one word, it's stunning. Let's take a look. Got my bodyguard now. Got my bodyguard. Grandmama gonna make some sweet potato pies and some cakes. Everybody, please put your hands together for Ramel Ross. Let's hear it. Um, uh, Holy shit. I cannot believe this is nominated for Best Documentary. It's wild. It's, it's actually wild. I mean, you made uh, a beautiful film, but you also made an intentionally non-narrative, narrative, radical approach to documentary. Um, and the fact that we normally get nominations that are about famous people or about or blandly about historical incidents. Um, and we got this and a couple other movies this year as well. Not as radical as this, but something that you would never expect is really inspiring and I think should give hope to any filmmaker out there, especially in, in documentary who wants to approach it in a new and exciting way. What was, let's just start with what was it like when you found out you were nominated? It was, it was surreal, but I will say that the film the film is intentional in every way, but yeah. it wasn't intentionally radical. I think um, what happened was I was really conscious of the way in which media has participated in the imaging of, of people of color and black folks. And so a lot of the things that happen in the film are responding to the problems of other ways of representing. And so then by default, that's not you know, reflecting the dominant way to, to make something. And then it's radical, you know? You say images, but do you also mean narrative as well? Yeah, yeah. I think they're I think they're tied because there's a a simplicity to yeah. the image that offers an easy narrative, which sort of participates in a, a you know a very traditional understanding of what it means to be that person or what it means to come from where they came from. Yeah, this is something that I've been thinking about a lot lately, which is how we are a culture of stories, yeah. and some of those stories are dated, and it's not just the fact that they're cliche or stereotypical when it comes to people of color, or when it comes to us as Americans as a whole, is that they have certain expectations, and they have certain ways that we hope that they wrap up or expect them to wrap up, or means at which people can exemplify something within that story, yeah. and that we've reached this sort of weird point where those story stories have infiltrated reality and we expect reality to interact with stories the same way, and they don't. Yeah. Um, so were you thinking about that when you were going to make, when you approached this, this movie? Yeah, exactly. I was thinking that, you know, recognizing that there was a relationship between consumption and, you know, a, being a person of color and being a black folk in the U.S., and it starts from the body, then it, like, moves to the image, where you're just you're sort of feeding people these very simplistic notions of life and emotion and struggle that um, that quite often don't fit into the everyday banality of the black experience or the everyday beauty. Um, and a lot of the work 
that is made around those topics are needed because, you know, there's, you know, I think 2017, there's like 22% of black folks were living in poverty. That's like a very serious number. But to me, it's like there's so many ways to learn something or to know something. Stories are, you know, universal throughout all cultures, but experience to me is the first means of knowledge production, right? Like you give someone an experience and that's where they really are able to form some ideas or... Can I ask, how difficult was it for you to train your mind to sort of separate yourself from, from a good story developing or some, something happening or something in the edit room that feels like it's going to do what a classic story does? Because as much as we say that, you know, that's just, that's the intention of the director or the editor, those are just ingrained in our head as to how to tell a story. Yeah. Well, I think I was fortunate enough to enter into filmmaking from the perspective of an artist or whatever that means and not as a filmmaker who was attempting to tell a story. Also from the, a photographic perspective in which you're not necessarily interested in narrative with the image at all times. You're sometimes interested in abstraction or ambiguity or um, just simple rendition. And so given those, I think I had a little bit more freedom and I, you know, I wasn't making the film to make money and I wasn't making the film, my, my like life wasn't dependent on if the film did well or not. So I was kind of just doing my thing, you know? Um, also, I made an edit five months in, so I shot for five years, really long time. Um, not that most documentaries aren't shot for a long time, but we had 1300 hours, which is like an obscene amount of hours. I made an edit five months in that sort of reproduced some of the problems I thought to be ingrained in documentaries about folks of color. And so immediately went back to the footage I had and like sought out symbolic moments and metaphoric moments and beautiful moments. And I had this music um, from my friend that I really loved. And I sort of spontaneously made this, this like three minute edit that is the baseline for the film. And so from that point on, I was able to sort of shoot towards that as opposed to look back after shooting for five years and be like, I can't believe I'm doing this, you know? There's something so beautiful about watching a documentary that you can never feel the filmmaker behind the camera going, that's our story. Yeah. We got it. Um, and you feel someone just sort of pensive and observational and trying to experience moments with, with people. Um, and your celebration of certain moments are, again, not the stereotypical obvious moments that I think people would go for. One of my favorite moments in the film is a shot of smoke billowing through trees as the sun tries to spill through those trees as well. And it's just this incredible like layer of image that's, that's happening. You know, when you were shooting those moments, were you thinking to yourself, this is an incredible moment, I'll make sure this has, happens in the movie? Was that you going, that's my moment, <laughs> that's the movie? Yeah, yes and no. So one idea for the film was, how do you participate in the lives of those who you're filming and how do you respond to what's in front of you as opposed to sort of preconceive a way to capture it? which is why there's time lapses, there's like still shots, there's like wide stills, there's, you know, the moment of Kyrie where you're, you know, just chasing him with the camera for, you know, four minutes or so. Um, and around so- the, Around the living room, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. A, yeah. Um, and so it varies, but I think, uh, you know, you wait, for me, it was a process of waiting a day, t a, two days or a week for, to, to encounter the smoke or for something magical to happen. So you know when it's special because you've been slightly disappointed with the surrealness of the rest of the images you've been capturing, though beautiful and though interesting. And then all of a sudden you walk out of a trailer and a storm's born on the horizon and it's over in 10 seconds. And you're like, yes, this is, this is in the film. My heart's beating fast. I can't believe this sort of just happened. And so for the smoke, I just picked Daniel up from Selma University. We were driving back to Greensboro and you could see smoke like in the distance, I wanna say like 20 miles. And we were like, what's that? And we just sort of followed it and then got to someone's house and then got out and, and talked to them and started filming the smoke. And yeah, it was, uh, it, you know, I encounter the images as you encounter the images. But that said, it takes a certain person, you, to know that there is poetry in a shot of a toddler running back and forth from a hallway to a living room for three straight minutes, you know? Uh, that shot is unbelievably beautiful, 
but I don't know if I, if I was in the room with a camera, I would know that that is beautiful. It takes you putting it into a context, um, the context of this film to tell me that this is a beautiful moment. How did you know out of 1300 hours of footage that that was something that would be so, um, people would respond to it so well? I think at some point in my life, I don't know when I just became fascinated with the act of looking and, and the mundane you know, and the mundane and <clears throat> actually I think it it originates in sports where you're sort of sitting on the sideline and you're watching your teammates you're I played point guard so you're like constantly analyzing the floor you're you're looking at you know the gestures and micro movements and behavior in order to figure out what's going to happen and um, kind of control the game as much as possible so that to me like f you know moves perfectly into using the camera which is also like a thing of space and a thing of time, and a thing of prediction, and a thing of consciousness, um, and awareness, and so. That's such a fascinating analogy to me because as a person who doesn't particularly love sports and generally characterizes sports in pejorative ways, <laughs> 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 yeah. to, t to hear from you that there's a poetry and an art to it is yeah. like, okay, all right, fine, fine, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I, it's weird, I, I like realized, I think my junior year in college when I was playing that I was more interested in the poetry and the art of the sport than I was the, comp the competition and the scoring of it. Mm. And once I stopped playing and I like, needed something else to do, some other thing to strive for, and I moved into art and film, I think I just naturally drew from all of the, the things that were ingrained. That, like, which is, I think, another thing that's interesting. It's like when you do something, you know, like the con man is, everyone's a mark to the con man. You know, the activist, everything is a political moment and a political gesture. Like to the athlete that plays a sport, like it reframes the way in which you see the world. You start training yourself to see things in certain ways and it filters out to the real world. Photography does the same thing yeah. for people, you know? Um, but also as an image-based culture, we take in the images and then we see the world in the way in which we believe the photographs, well, the way in which the photographs have embedded a, a sort of worldview in us. And this is kind of the problem with photography and with black folks is because it's constantly offering a simplistic version of our reality and replacing the experience of communities of color and of black folks for people who don't have intimate relationships with communities of color and black folks. And so this becomes the reality that they know and this is the reality that they vote towards when they go to the voting booth because they don't know anything else. So the idea that photography has become this thing that it's like, oh, that's a good, people can say, oh, that's a good picture because they've seen that picture before and they can look at uh, an, a, a story about a person of color and say, oh, that's a good story about a person of color because they've seen that story before or that's an authentic story about a person of color because they've seen that story before. That's what they've been sort of trained vis-a-vis -vis media and images to think is, is the appropriate story or the authentic story. Exactly, and that ends up being more of a problem when those images aren't made by people from that community and of those people because by default you're dressing someone up in a costume that they didn't choose and you don't have access to the way in which um, they believe that their reality is built um, and that that fantasy connection is I think kind of how the US has been built. Yeah. Um, let's backtrack. How did you end up in Hale County? Why down there? What made you go down there and start shooting? Incredibly spontaneous. I wish I had some, you know, super intentional story as to, and like having like a grand plan, but I went there to teach a two week photography course on a whim and a job opened up in this program called Youth Build. It's like a Department of Labor funded program working with, you know, youth 16 to 24 who had left school for various reasons. And I was like, hey, I would, I'd live here. I was working in DC freelancing and not making much money. So um, Alabama seemed like an, an interesting place to sort of catch up on you know, my debt problem and mm -hmm. um, learn a little bit about myself and continue to photograph because I was making images. So you were, you were already taking photos there and you were living there and so you just started, it just started kind of coming together. Yeah, well the film, like I didn't start shooting until I'd lived there for three years. I also didn't start the photographs that I show and like the photographs that I'm like known for, which is also a funny thing. It's like acclaimed photographer, Ramel Ross. And I've never seen that acclaim. <laughs> <laughs> I'm confused as to where, what acclaim means when they're applying it to um, me. You mean as people introduce you for this film now, they yeah. say acclaimed photographer? Yeah, they're like acclaimed photographer with... Does it say that on the poster, a film by acclaimed... No, it's just a film <laughs> That by. would be great. 
I would erase it right now on the <laughs> digital screen with this invisible eraser. Um, yeah, so I was photographing, and I think it's, it actually took three years to make images that I was proud of. Um, and the images that I'm at, on my website and that like, I have in shows now and that um, I'm showing the world all, are the ones that I had to get to through you know, three years of reproducing the visual platitudes of the South. Like right. three years of, sh of sort of shedding the romanticism that most people pedal in when they're traveling or you know, when you go to a country and you're like, oh, this is the country, oh, look at the landscape, um, and sort of get to something a little bit more meaningful. And this is the same time I started to film because I felt like I sort of understood something about the way in which images not only reproduce reality, but reproduce ideology through the images. Is there a part of you that while you're shooting something, you think to yourself, oh, that's beautiful. How do I break this and remake it into something else that's, that's beautiful? I think of, because you're talking about the landscape in the South, I think of that incredible shot in the film out the car window of the fields. Um, and it takes a second to recognize exactly what those fields are. But you get it. And then it's, it, it is beautiful and it's haunting, but it is not in the same way that I think, as we said, another filmmaker or someone who's trying to replicate the images of the South before would do it. So how, when you saw that, when you see, how do you think of how to photograph that when you see it? Yeah, I think it's... Or do you try to trust your gut and then edit with it later? It's definitely trusting the gut. I, when I, you know, you pass by that cotton field when you're going from Greensboro to Marion or Marion to Selma, depending on which way you go. And I mean, I was, I, I, every time I pass it, I kind of stop and look at it and I'm, I'm floored that folks pass it every day. Yeah. You know, like it's, to me, that's a strange, strange thing. And so I actually- You capture, you capture that so well by, sorry, I interrupted okay. you. But like Please. by looking out the window and by driving by it, you capture that sensation. And it's like a, it's a, it's a, it's a thing where it's happening in moments, that, that sensation where you're like, what is that? Oh, that's a cotton field. Oh, it's a part of this movie. Oh, we're still looking at it. We're still driving by it. And, and it just becomes representative of more and more and more. It's a beautiful sequence, which is just one shot. Yeah, thanks. I think... You got it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think I got... I don't want to say... I don't want to say lucky because... I, but I, I do think luck is the sort of underlying thread for a lot of things. I feel like there's... There's shooting something and going towards uh, a quote-unquote universal aesthetic, which is what you mentioned when someone sees a photograph and they're like, I like that photograph because I recognize its form. And then there's a shooting towards a personal poetic, which is, you know, if you imagine someone, you know, using, being trained in creating visuals in the same way that someone is trained to write at a young age, writing essays and then going to college and still doing writing in English and science classes, where you can sort of develop your own understanding of the vis of visual syntax, what it means to you and what symbolism means to you, born out of your community and born out of your family and born out of the cartoons that you specifically watched. Um, and I think that is what I was trying to do in the film is, is sort of use my worldview and images and symbolism. And within that, um, then within the context of, uh, of the film and trying to shoot observationally as I would in real life, passing by the cotton field is how I would encounter it. I wouldn't go out in the cotton field. I wouldn't get close to some cotton and rack focus and I wouldn't be walking you through the, the space. Like I drive by it every day. So how do I just reproduce my experience as opposed to shooting towards something that um, is not my true encounter with that reality? Um, you know, we talk about it, the film as if it is solely abstract, but there are, for lack of a better word, characters in it. There are people that you that you are following. How did you choose them, and how did you sort of make sure that while you had characters that the audience was curious about and wanted to know more about, you didn't sort of bring the audience into this, what we've been talking about, a sort of classically formed story that made it very easy to recognize them as characters rather than as people? Yeah, the, so the film is is kind of anti-consumption. It was it was actually built to be yeah, it's, not easily yeah, it's consumed. nominated for an Oscar. This <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> is why it's so wild. We're like we we smuggled fine art into the Academy, yeah. and now we you know people. I think and it's I think it's a good thing have to account for the way in which documentaries are built. You know. Um, and before, it's kind of like a sort of invisible 
structure and an invisible language that's situated in truth and then you know doesn't quite um, reflect the inner experiences or it doesn't doesn't quite openly use subjectivity as truth you know it's always moving towards objectivity intentionally even if it's within someone's perspective um, and so I forgot the question <laughs> that happens a lot you know when when um I get really into what I'm saying. Where were you when you found out you got nominated? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the first question. We go back to the beginning. No, wait. We, we were talking about uh, the cotton field, and then we were like... Smuggle, oh, yeah. You smuggled fine art into the... Yeah. Smuggling. Legally smuggling, Legally of course. Legally smuggling, yeah. Um, yeah, so the film is built to be... Anti-consumption. Anti-consumption. Yeah. But, but also imaginatively spurring. Like, it's supposed to allow you to wander in your imagination in the context of am ambiguous black imagery and black perspective in order for you to be confronted with your relationship to... Your assumptions. Your assumptions, yeah. 100% yeah. um, right. Yeah. Like, while I'm watching it as a hoity-toity white liberal in New York, I'm like, when is something bad going to happen? <laughs> Which is 100% racist thing that is just because I've been indoctrinated by how we tell black stories in this country. Yeah. It's consistently negative. It's consistently based around something that, uh, around tragedy, Yeah, which is not the, I mean, there is something happens in this, but it's not what you, what is expected or what would normally happen. Yeah. It gives you like something to feel that is not an emotion that's based on, um, you know, a pre-ordered response to, to trauma or tragedy or expression. It gives you something to feel, I think, within the narrative of yourself in some sense, you know, in your relationship to whatever's happening. And to pick up on the questions you asked, I, I, I met Quincy and Daniel, and those were the two guys. They did ask that. Yeah. <laughs> I remembered. I remembered. <laughs> it took a while. While you were talking, I wasn't listening. I was thinking. I was like, what did he ask? And then I remembered. Um, yeah, both of them were just two guys I, I connected with really deeply while I was there. And I say, you know, it's really impossible to say why. It's kind of like when you go to college and you have you meet a bunch of people and there's two people that you're like, we're speaking the same language, you know? Yeah. Um, and those were the two guys. And so they were the first that I asked to make the film with, you know? I want to go back to the film being anti-consumption yeah. because um, that opens up to another question about what does get consumed and how the system consumes things. Um, everyone always really says about capitalism and about, about art is that even the thing, eventually it just consumes whatever is re rebelling against it. Yeah. And if you made something that's anti-consumption, whereas some people who make things that they say are anti-consumption actually fit the form of a pop song yeah. or fit the form of a clear narrative movie, so therefore they are easy to consume. You, on the other hand, have done something radical and made something that's somewhat difficult to consume doesn't conform to the notions of consumption, but it is now being consumed in yeah. the most s mainstream way. What does that feel like? It feels like I failed. No. That's um, what I was getting at. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, no, it, it feels good because the, you know, it's, it's a sort of political statement that I think if digested to its permanent and its in conclusion can assist in the reimagining of what it means to be a person of color, both for people of color and both for people who aren't people of color. And then that's a success, you know? Um, I think it's also, it's, it, I think it shows that, which I think is, there's two things I think that are really interesting um, about the film, amongst other things. One, that it shows that there's other ways to do things that we've been doing the same way for a long time. And we forget that, you know, we forget that, you know, when we walk outside, we walk on the street because that's the, we walk on the sidewalk because that's the default way to walk, you know? Someone's predetermined the way in which we move through the space. Someone's also predetermined the way in which we use the camera. Someone's predetermined the way in which we take photographs. Like everything is sort of built already. And it's our job, I think, as responsible citizens um, and responsible makers to like think about the, the pre existing forms and what those forms mean for. Um, treating people or for, you know, you know, feigning truth or portraying truth. I also think that what's most interesting about the narrative part is the pressure that it puts on 
specifically in the doc world, the pressure puts on the, the, the characters and the protagonists. Like, when we first started to make the film, Daniel's like, is this, are we going to make like a Hoop Dreams? And I'm like, no, because, you know, it's not about the decisions that you make every day. The decisions that you are given are part of a systematic offering platter of decisions. You shouldn't have to choose whether or not to work seven for $7 an hour or to sell drugs or to play basketball and, like, not do this. Like, you should have more options. And if we make the film about your decisions and the, the options that you have and decisions that you make, uh, people will judge your decisions and say, oh, I thought he should have done this kind of unconsciously and not attribute the decisions to a lack of decisions or a systematic problem that so we Again, solve. turns them into characters. Yeah. Doesn't, doesn't keep them real people. It turns them into this sort of like slightly distanced thing that you can judge and feel comfortable judging. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But you're not knocking hoop dreams on my face. Oh, God, hoop dreams was awesome. Thank you. I mean, I've talked to Steve James. I was like, thank you, man. Like a real hug, you know? It's the greatest. Yeah. Maybe the greatest. Yeah. It's, um, I think we have time for a couple questions, right? Who has a question? Right here. Hi. Hi. Hello. My name is Kaylin, and I'm a film student. And I really like what you're talking about, about like finding art and everything, because that's kind of like the opposite of what we're taught. What other advice would you have for like art, like artists of color, filmmakers of color, just artists in general, like young artists? Mm -hmm. Yeah, advice. I'm so bad with advice. Because this is also, I sound like an absolutist when I talk, but I'm very flexible, and um, I only kind of believe what I'm saying. Right. I'm just You're kidding. probably going to go home and watch, like, a really fun TV show tonight <laughs> yeah. or, like, something that really is yeah. completely consum consumable. Yeah. I'm going to go watch some reality television <laughs> and, uh, and drink some beer. That's not true. I do neither. I do drink beer. Um, but I, what I would do... Not what I would do. For, I guess, for upcoming filmmakers, I think that it's important to realize the... Okay, this is what I'll say. This is hard, because I only have one shot at this, you know? Um, I'm also going to time you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, we are... Now we have one more question left instead of four. Um, when you're... I think when someone's making something, they're... Prop, their, um, their propositioning in some sense. It's like, so like what you're making is either contributing to the reality that exists or it's confronting it or it's like analyzing it. Like what is what you want to make? How is what you're making contributing to the larger media culture? And how, are, how can you think about the many ways in which you know, what you're making can do one thing positive and one thing negative, right? So if you make a story that is a, um, you know, you do a short film about, someone living in the projects and struggling and pulling themselves up by their bootstraps and whatever happens, you're giving someone access in a beautiful way to potentially what it's like to, to be in the struggle, but you're also just telling another struggle narrative. So you can like simultaneously be doing something good and doing something bad that just cancels itself out, you know? Um, and so just, I guess, just think deeply about how your, your images are contributing to media culture. That was the worst answer ever. It was bad, right? You expected something like, you can do anything. Okay. I would have loved if you just told him it was a terrible answer. <laughs> like, if you had the guts, like, that was awful. Yeah. Thank, thanks for nothing. That was a great answer. Just gotten up and walked out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one more question. Hi. Hello. Um, you said that it took you five years to make this film. Um, I was curious, as a documentary filmmaker, how you know when to stop, uh, especially when it's a story that's kind of beautiful for the reason of being nonlinear. Yeah. Now that's a good question. Thank you. Does Ooh. it look like... Does Yours it... was good, too. Oh, sh I, I didn't mean to say... I hate it when people do that. It's like being like, I really like your shoes, but, you know, you can't... I like your shoes. Your answer was great. Yours was good, too. Um, I think that... Do I look like a person that knows when to stop? <laughs> I don't know if I can even answer that question. No, really, I think... I think it's all situational, you know? And for this project, I didn't know when to stop. I actually imagined it halfway through as being um, three films filming Daniel and Quincy over the course of their lives and doing the same thing forever. Um, and I realized, we realized, my team, um, primarily Jocelyn Barnes, Mike Krinsky, and Rob Moss, who are on the edit squad, that we needed like a clear marker to stop, and that was the eclipse the 2017 eclipse, because I had been filming the sun and the moon and the light so much that that was like a sort of 
clear conceptual ending. And then in the edit space, we could put that on the timeline and then figure out how to work around that and get to that point. Um, in terms of working with Daniel and Quincy, I, you know, I still filmed with them for like you know five months or so after the film was finished, just because it's part of my life and it was something that I was interested in doing. So I don't know. I don't know when one finishes. I think it's always situational, um, and there's nothing wrong with continuing to go until you got nothing left in the tank. You know, even the way that you choose to film the clips breaks down how I think someone would normally film that or think about it or think about presenting it. You know, they would think about presenting something that is normally conceived of as beautiful or beautific and that you sort of strip it of, of that and create a completely different kind of poetry. There's no question there. Just, it's, a great, it's a great moment, a great shot, and your sound design in that, in that, in that scene is wonderful as well. Um, I'm not sure if it's clear enough, but I love the film. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, good luck at the Academy Awards. What is, are you excited to be there, or is that a weird thing to, to be there? It's so weird. Like, uh, I mean, none of this was expected, yeah. you know? Um, I don't, and I think you know, that... Like people ask Amy Adams, like, did you expect to get nominated for an award? And you, there's a part of her that's like, yeah. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> eventually, obviously. I have, like, a whole team that makes sure that this happens. And, like, I was in a movie by, like, one of the most celebrated directors in yeah. America, and it's like... You made a tone poem, yeah. a beautiful tone poem, and you're going to the Academy Awards. That's crazy. Yeah. And so what I do say, it means, it means the world to me because it was supported by so many people and so many organizations and people in the Academy who felt that it was a film that was worth seeing and a film that was worth sort of contributing to this canonical spot. And, you know, that's kind of what brings me to tears and what I was thinking when I to go back to your first question, when I saw that we were nominated, it was like, wow, I can't believe that so many people came behind in support. And then also acknowledging, you know, all the films that were before this that were similar in their desires and in their stance, but they were prepping the ground for this one to break through, yeah. you know? And so there'll be another film that's in the same vein that will do something more and that, you know, just to acknowledge that this is part of a trajectory. It's not a one-off splash. It's like, it's been... It's been built by a variety of filmmakers um, from even like the 60s and 70s that hopefully will be acknowledged at some point for their contribution to, to a film. Absolutely. Uh, Ramel, congratulations. Thanks so much for being here. Incredible work. Please give Ramel Ross a round of applause. Thank you.